The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. During the pandemic, Nicola Sturgeon made government decisions over WhatsApp. She was ordered by the UK COVID inquiry to retain those messages. The former First Minister promised to provide them. She said, I have nothing to hide. But we now know she deleted them all. She broke promises to grieving families. She may have broken the law. Does the First Minister accept it was completely wrong and utterly scandalous for Nicola Sturgeon to delete those messages? First Minister. Officer, before I answer Douglas Ross's question of uh, substance, can I just say at the offset, given this is the uh, uh, FMQ's uh, before Holocaust Memorial Day, that it has never been more important to remember the victims of the Holocaust and indeed with genocides which followed. Uh, together we remember the millions of lives that have been cut short with the utmost cruelty and brutality. The freedom and dignity of every citizen relies on our willingness to defend each other's human rights and to stand up against cruelty and violence everywhere in the world. It's a responsibility that we share equally. It's the responsibility of all of us to remember the Holocaust and, of course, to pay tribute to the survivors of those atrocities. So ahead of Holocaust Memorial Day on Saturday, my thoughts today, and I hope that everybody's thoughts, uh, my thoughts every day, should be with those who were affected then uh, and those who are affected uh, still. But let me come uh, on to the... Let me importantly come to the issue of uh, substance and I will start this exchange as I have started exchanges on this issue uh, in recent weeks and months and that is by giving first and foremost an unreserved apology to those families who were bereaved by COVID in relation to our handling of the issue of informal uh, communication such as WhatsApp. As an organisation on the issue of WhatsApp messages, uh, we did not handle the request in a way uh, that gave families uh, that have been bereaved by COVID uh, confidence, in fact, quite the opposite, and they have asked for nothing unreasonable. They've asked uh, for answers, they've asked for the truth, and I will certainly uh, do that when I appear in front of the inquiry later uh, today. Uh, Douglas Ross is asking me uh, about Nicola Sturgeon. Of course, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, I believe it's now been confirmed, will appear in front of the COVID inquiry uh, next week. She will answer uh, for herself. What I would say is when it comes to any decisions that are made, uh, as per records management policy, any decisions, whether it's made over WhatsApp, whether issues are discussed over email, over telephone call, any communication, any method of communication that's used, it's so important that those points are then, of course, uploaded to the corporate record, uh, any decisions that are made in any uh, salient uh, points. What I would say to Douglas Ross, and I'll end on this point, is we have, of course, handed over 28,000 WhatsApp messages, mine's included. That's in very stark contrast to the Prime Minister, of course. Yeah. Douglas Ross. Uh, can I fully associate myself uh, with the First Minister's remarks ahead of Holocaust Memorial Day uh, on Saturday? Uh, but I asked a very simple question. What did he feel about Nicola Sturgeon deleting these messages uh, and we heard nothing? But while Nicola Sturgeon led the cover-up and the secrecy, she wasn't alone. The then Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, also deleted his messages. And isn't it telling? that neither of them can be in the chamber today. So while they deleted messages, let's look at some of the messages we have seen. The Chief Medical Officer, Professor Gregor Smith, reminded colleagues in a WhatsApp chat to delete at the end of every day. Ken Thompson, the former Scottish Government Director General wrote, I feel moved at this point to tell you this chat is FOI recoverable. He went on, plausible, plausible deniability is my middle name. A message from the National Clinical Director, Jason Leach, said, WhatsApp deletion is my pre-bed ritual. And he also said, just my usual reminder to le delete your chat, particularly after we reach a conclusion. From politicians to civil servants, they sought to destroy evidence. Doesn't this show a culture of secrecy running through this entire SNP government. First Minister. Douglas Ross talks about the culture of secrecy. Well, we handed over 28,000 messages, 19,000 documents. Let's hear the First Minister. The former First Minister did 250 media briefings, taking questions from journalists day after day. That hardly rings true 
of the accusations that Douglas Ross is making of a government that was hiding from scrutiny. Far from that, every single day, the former First Minister was standing up taking questions. First Minister, that, First course, Minister, <coughs> First Minister, there are many members wishing to put questions in this session. It will make it far more likely that members will be taken if we can hear one another. First Minister. And can I say uh, to Douglas Ross, for all the accusations that he is throwing at the former First Minister, the former Deputy First Minister, and of course they will give evidence to the inquiry, I don't intend to prejudge that or put words in their mouth, I'm assuming then that those same accusations then ring true for his colleague, the Prime Minister, who hasn't handed over a single WhatsApp message. Because if, that accusa if the accusations that he is making against Nicola Sturgeon and that he's, hold, that, he's, that he's throwing towards the former Deputy First Minister, if he believes that doesn't hold true for the Prime Minister, who hasn't handed over a single message, then that isn't just political opportunism, it is breathtaking hypocrisy, Presiding Officer. Douglas Ross. That's just risable and embarrassing from the First Minister. Look at the facts here. Nicola Sturgeon destroyed all of her messages. She did that deliberately. But some have been recovered from other people. This morning's COVID inquiry session with Liz Lloyd, Nicola Sturgeon's former Chief of Staff, has revealed that COVID decisions were unquestionably made on WhatsApp. There are many examples in her evidence, but let's just take one. With just two hours to go before a statement in this parliament, Nicola Sturgeon said on WhatsApp that she was not sure what to do about the number of people at weddings and funerals. Her chief of staff replied, I think as we have only just put them up, we just leave it. I think we stay at 20. Therefore, a government decision to stay at 20 was taken over WhatsApp. Now, Hamza Youssef, Hamza Youssef, has previously said, and I quote, the Scottish Government did not routinely make decisions through WhatsApp. Did the First Minister mislead Parliament when he said that, or did he not realise that Members. government policy... Well, Members, I, I'm we happy, must hear one another. I'm happy to repeat this to SNP members who seem to want to drown this out. So did the First Minister mislead Parliament when he said that, or did he not realise that Scottish Government policy was being made on the hoof over WhatsApp? First Minister. Uh, WhatsApp is a communication application rather than a decision-making tool. Exactly. Instead, each minister... <laughs> the, each minister supported by a private office. This team, of course, compromises private secretaries and ministers of staff. A private office records the specific decisions of ministers for the official record. Uh, they're laughing. That is from the Scotland office. Of course, when we ask them for Douglas Ross's WhatsApp messages, of course, which they refused to release. So the point here is, the point here is, of course, that WhatsApp messages, WhatsApp is not Members. routinely used. Douglas Ross literally read out my quote. It's not routinely used. If it was used to make decisions, then of course, well, they're getting, they're getting up first in arms minister, over what Douglas Ross First Minister, I am sorry, I cannot hear a word that you are saying, and that will be the case for those who are visiting the Parliament today. And I would ask all members to remember the requirement to conduct our business in an orderly manner. Because the truth is inconvenient for the Conservatives here, because it's very, very simple. That if decisions were made over WhatsApp, then of course they would have to be recorded. Otherwise, how on earth would they be actioned? Exactly. So they're then recorded on the corporate record and taken forward. All salient points and all key decisions. Let me just go back to the point I made uh, in response to the very first question that Douglas Ross asked. I do believe uh, that there are challenges in relation to our use of WhatsApp. It has not been, uh, frankly, the government's uh, finest hour in relation to handling those requests. And I put my hands up to that. Uh, unlike, of course, other uh, governments. And that's why I have commissioned officials to deliver an externally led review, so not a government review, but externally led review into the use of mobile messaging apps and the use of non-corporate technology in the Scottish Government. And that should take particular account uh, of uh, our interaction with statutory public uh, inquiries. But when it comes to uh, being transparent, I go back to the point that I've made. 
The government handed over 28,000 messages, 19,000 documents. I myself, as First Minister of the government, have handed over my WhatsApp messages. That is in stark contrast to the UK government, uh, to yeah. the Prime Minister, who has refused to hand over a single yeah. message and, of course, took the inquiry to court only to lose. Yeah. Douglas Ross. There was so much in that. Can I just be absolutely clear? I'm not sure what the First Minister was speaking about my own WhatsApps. I provided my WhatsApps from my time as a government minister to the COVID inquiry, and they are there uh, on the record. Unlike senior nationalists, I didn't delete mine. But the evidence we've heard today is, quite frankly, shocking. It confirms that pandemic decisions by the SNP were made for political purposes. Yeah. Well, they're saying what? The Education Secretary is saying what on earth? Well, let me say, Nicola Sturgeon's Chief of Staff talks of making, and I quote, purely political moves on public health to start a good old-fashioned rammy with the UK government. In another handwritten note, in another handwritten note, she says she is going to look at political tactics calling for things we can't do. Hiding revelations like this must have been the reason that the SNP government destroyed so much evidence. The First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, the National Clinical Director, the Chief Medical Officer all deleted their messages. Discussions and crucial decisions have vanished. A top-down culture of secrecy was rife throughout this entire government. It looks like the most senior figures have engaged in a deliberate cover-up. So now it's been confirmed I have your that question, the SNP made some crucial COVID decisions for purely political reasons. Is Hamza Youssef ashamed that the SNP government made purely political reasons during the pandemic? And isn't that the ultimate betrayal of the public who sacrificed so much? First Minister. I reject, uh, I, I, I reject the charge uh, in its entirety. Uh, presiding officer. We had, of course, and published regularly the approach in relation to the four harms uh, approach that we took uh, in regards to decisions that were made in relation to the pandemic. And every single day, I can say uh, with confidence that our overarching priority was always to keep the people of this country safe. That was what the overarching priority was. Mr. Ross. That was the overarching priority. Did we get every decision right? Absolutely not. And we will be rightly questioned about that in both the UK inquiry and the Scottish uh, inquiry. But I know our motivation every step of the way was to ensure that we kept the people of this country safe. Was that not in stark contrast, of course, to a UK government holding parties in number 10, uh, holding parties in the Treasury and the obscene spectacle of the then Members. Prime Minister flagrantly breaching the rules yep. while the loved ones, uh, individuals, families couldn't go to their loved ones' uh, funerals. Yep. And throughout all of that, Presiding Officer, Douglas Ross hasn't had the decency to apologise once. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding Officer, Saturday marks Holocaust Memorial Day on the theme Fragility of Freedom a day we pause, reflect and remember all those who have been victims of genocide, but also a moment to pause and reflect on those that still strive to live with peace, with dignity, away from conflict and without prejudice. What has been revealed at the COVID inquiry this week has rightly shocked people across Scotland. The attempts to subvert the inquiry and to breach freedom of information laws is frankly a betrayal of the trust people put into this government. WhatsApp messages deleted on an industrial scale. The former First Minister using a private SNP email address for government business. Officials openly joking about breaking the law while the COVID pandemic tore through our country. The culture of cover-up started with the First Minister and extended down to the senior civil service. In June, when I asked Hamza Youssef if, and I quote, all requested emails texts and WhatsApp messages will be handed over in full, he responded in this parliament without equivocation, yes. Now that we know this wasn't true, was the First Minister knowingly misleading parliament or was he so out of his depth he didn't know what, he was, what was going on? First Minister. 
Of course, we did hand over what we had. 28,000 messages that we have have been handed over. For those officials, or indeed former ministers of the government, that don't have WhatsApp messages, they will have to account for that in front of the inquiry. But Anna Sarwar can't say that there was deletion on an industrial scale when 28,000 messages have been handed over to the COVID inquiry. He can't say that I've been leading that from the top when I've handed over all of the WhatsApp messages uh, I have, and no doubt in a few hours, in a couple of hours' time, will be questioned uh, about them. So I think uh, Anna Sarwar is absolutely right, as Douglas Ross is, to ask questions about informal communications. There's nothing wrong uh, in that. But to suggest that somehow uh, there was a cover-up, I frankly uh, do not believe even the public uh, agree with Anna Sarwar nor, D nor Douglas Ross. Why? Because the public looked at this government, questioned this government, saw that this government had a First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who stood in front of the cameras every Let's single hear the First day, Minister. Every single day, and took questions from journalists, from members of this parliament, over 250 times. Hardly, hardly the measure or the mark of a government that was trying to avoid scrutiny, presiding officer. Anna Sarwar. I think the First Minister must live in a parallel universe. The First Minister at the time deleted every WhatsApp message. The Deputy First Minister at the time deleted every WhatsApp message. The Chief Medical Officer at the time deleted every WhatsApp message. The National Clinical Director at the time deleted every WhatsApp message. If that is not deletion at an industrial scale, I do not know what planet Hamza Youssef lives in. Now, the First Minister gave an unequivocal commitment to Parliament, but on his watch, Ministers and officials failed to comply with Do Not Destroy Notices. Key evidence has been deleted and deliberately misleading statements have been given to the press and the public on his watch. One specific issue I raised with Hamza Youssef was the use of private SNP email accounts to conduct government business, something they have repeatedly denied. But evidence to the inquiry this week has blown that claim out of the water. When I asked Hamza Youssef in November if all emails, be they government or party emails, will be handed to the inquiry, again he said this in this parliament. As for any other form of communication, including any other email address, it is my full expectation that it, that is handed over. He is First Minister and leader of the SNP, so can I ask him, have any emails from SNP accounts been handed to the COVID inquiry, and if so, how many? First Minister. Uh, to Anna Sawar, uh, of course, the, the, the point which I think is fundamental here, the use of a non-government email address, such as an SNP uh, email address, that doesn't exempt official correspondence from freedom of information requests. Uh, for example, if there's a freedom of information request for a particular, about a particular issue or for a particular document, that is not subverted because it's, it's been sent to an SNP Members. email address. Uh, therefore, it should be handed over. Uh, I can give an absolute guarantee when it comes to my SNP uh, email address, no government business was conducted over it. Uh, and, of course, in any private, uh, in any private communication uh, application that I have, uh, things have, uh, messages uh, have been uh, handed over. Not, over. not only have I handed over uh, WhatsApp messages on my private Twitter account, where there's been private uh, DMs, uh, that they have also uh, been handed over uh, to. So when it comes to the government, uh, I have made it very clear to every single minister, every single cabinet secretary, the permanent secretary has made it clear to every single civil servant uh, that uh, regardless of the method of communication uh, that is used, uh, that we must comply with the Public Records Act, with FOI legislation and indeed with a mobile messaging policy. I go back uh, to the point that I made to Douglas Ross, that regardless of the communication uh, method used, whether it's an SNP email address or otherwise, any decisions that are made uh, must be recorded in the corporate record uh, and the salient points uh, therefore recorded as well. And we'll continue to comply fully, as I intend to do in a couple of hours' time, uh, with the UK COVID inquiry. Anna Sarwar. This is meant to be a government he's in charge of and a party he's in charge of, but he can't answer for anybody else in government or his party and only goes back to his own messages and his own emails. But this isn't just about the inquiry, this is about how this government operates. Absolutely. Because this is a party that over the last 17 years in government has created a culture of secrecy and cover-up. A culture that goes from the First Minister down. Because the SNP believe that it's one standard for them and another standard for everyone else. Because somehow the rules don't apply to the SNP. They have abused the trust that the people of Scotland put in them. And if they won't take my word from it, Maybe they should listen to Caroline Stewart of the Scottish COVID Bereaved. 
She said this, I trusted them. I felt him and Nicola Sturgeon were honest and trying to be open with us and to find out that that was all just a facade. I don't understand how they can hold their head up high. First Minister, how can you ever expect the people of Scotland to trust you or your party ever again? Always through the chair, please, First I'll Minister. I always leave the verdict of trust to the Scottish people. And that is why we will comply with much of the UK inquiry, the Scottish COVID inquiry, which, of course, we instructed. When it comes to transparency, that's why we've handed over 28,000 WhatsApp messages. That's transparency. 19,000 documents. That's transparency. When it comes to what this government has done across a range of portfolios, whether it's the duty of candor, whether it's the patient safety commissioner, that is transparency. Whether it's public inquiries and instructing them, that is transparency. Whether it was the former First Minister standing up in over 250 media conferences, that was transparency. Taking questions from this chamber on Let's multiple hear occasions, the First Minister. dozens of occasions, that is transparency. And I will end where I started my, my, my response to Douglas Ross, that when it comes to those families that have been bereaved by COVID, first and foremost, our responsibility is to them. I can promise them when I appear in front of the inquiry that I know that they won't just want warm words, they will want to see and hear truthful answers to straight questions. And that's what I intend to do when I appear in front of the inquiry in a couple of hours' time. Soon. Thank you. We have many members, as you would expect, wishing to put questions today. I'd be grateful if we could, therefore, keep our questions and responses concise. And at question number three, I call Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to associate the Scottish Greens with the First Minister and ask Sarwar's remarks ahead of Holocaust Memorial Day to ask the First Minister whether he'll provide an update on how the Scottish Government will continue to protect tenants in the private rented sector after the expiry of the rent cap under the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act 2022. First Minister. The Scottish Government, the Scottish government has uh, led the way, far ahead of any other part of the UK, in protecting private tenants against rent rises and eviction during the cost of living crisis. We are absolutely committed to supporting tenants when these protections end on the 31st of March 2024. That is why yesterday regulations were laid that will, subject to approval of course of this Parliament, temporarily amend the existing rent adjudication process for a period of 12 months. This will help protect tenants from excessively large rent increases that could be experienced if there's a move back to open market rent in a single step, uh, whilst enabling landlords to continue to reinvest in our private rented sector. The Minister for Tenant Rights has written to the Lead Committee with further details. Ross Greer. I thank the First Minister for that answer and for highlighting that the emergency rent protections in Scotland have been far ahead of anything else in the UK. A lead role that Scotland will continue when long-term rent controls are introduced in the Housing Bill very soon. Some tenants watching today, though, may be receiving rent increase notices right now, which are well above the 3% cap. So can the First Minister reassure tenants that the rent cap remains fully in place until the 31st of March and that any tenant receiving a cap-busting rent increase notice before then should challenge that rise? And can I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to make sure that tenants know about and are able to use their rights? First Minister. Uh, yes, I can confirm that the uh, emergency rent cap remains in place until the end of March. So any rent increase notice uh, issued before the 1st of April is very much subject uh, to that cap, even if the, the increase won't apply uh, until after uh, that date. If a tenant receives a rent increase notice above that, uh, they should uh, refer it to Rent Service Scotland and rent will be set uh, in line with the cap. Uh, I fully agree that tenants need to know their rights uh, and what their rights are and how to act uh, upon them. That's why a national renters' rights marketing campaign will launch very soon uh, indeed, and that will highlight existing rights and the changes when the measures uh, end, uh, when the emergency measures uh, end. That will include online guidance and tools to help people understand how the changes affect them specifically. Uh, the government has taken very clear action, a very bold action to support people through the cost crisis. We're determined to build on that and our forthcoming housing bill will set out proposals for longer-term reform of the rental sector. And we're committed to working, of course, not just with tenants, that's crucial, but also with responsible landlords and other key stakeholders to ensure the legislation delivers reform uh, that works uh, in reality. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
the SNP Green Rent Cap has not only failed to tackle the housing emergency, but has exacerbated it. Rents in Scotland have increased by more than 14 per cent, despite the SNP and Green Rent Cap. And as a result of the cap, Scotland is only part of the UK where the numbers of properties sold by landlords have gone up. This ill thought policy has hindered mobility, caused enormous price hikes when people do move, and has reduced the availability of housing by driving landlords out of the market. Does the First Minister agree that his government's interferences in the market has been nothing short of a disaster? And will he scrap this cap? First Minister. My goodness, uh, that is the most conservative contribution I think I've ever heard in this chamber. How dare the government interfere in the middle of a UK government's cost of living crisis to help tenants because of the economic damage that they've caused, presiding officer. How dare we have the temerity to protect renters because of the economic vandalism of Pam Gosol's party. And of course, her contribution doesn't bear the reality, doesn't bear uh, the facts, which of course... First Minister, if First at... Minister, if I might stop you there, I am aware of members who are clearly having a conversation with one another across the aisles. It's totally unacceptable during First Minister's questions. Please continue. And of course it doesn't bear uh, the reality. If we look at the facts, the latest Scottish landlord register data shows the number of registered properties for rent in Scotland between August 22 and November 23 has actually increased. So we, of course, will work with responsible uh, landlords. Of course, we'll work with tenants and other stakeholder groups. But let me say to Pam Gosal, I'll never make an apology for making sure that we're on the right side of this argument. <laughs> Cocab Stewart. Um, the new rent adjudication rules are welcome, empowering private tenants to challenge any uh, unreasonable rent hikes. But for that proposed transition to work as intended, tenants need to be fully informed of those rights. Can the Scottish Government expand on how they intend uh, to ensure that both renters and private landlords across Scotland understand the system that will be in place from April? First Minister. I absolutely agree with that. I think it's uh, vital that both tenants and landlords are made aware of the changes that will come into place from the 1st of April. Tenants understanding their rights and how to act upon them is a crucial part of the changes that we are making to the rent adjudication process, uh, working effectively uh, in practice. That's why we're working, as I would mentioned, I think, to Ross, uh, in response to Ross Greer's, Greer's, Ross Greer's question, on a range of awareness raising uh, activities and provision of clear guidance to support people through that transitionary period. Um, a national renters' rights marketing campaign will launch very soon, and we're also working on an online rent increase calculator to assist landlords and tenants in establishing what rent could be charged from the 1st of April should it be subject to adjudication. Question number four, Michelle Thompson. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government regarding the status of the Grangemouth refinery. First Minister. This week, the Energy Secretary chaired the first meeting of the Grangemouth Future Industry Board, which includes representatives of the refinery, uh, its workforce, plus the UK Government. I'm encouraged that the UK Minister of State uh, for Energy, Security and Net Zero did respond positively to Neil Gray's request to consider any proposal that supports a long-term and sustainable future for the Grangemouth Industrial Cluster, recognising its very strategic national importance to the economy of the whole of the UK. My government is committed uh, to exploring all options to extend the life of the refinery and bring forward new transition projects at pace. I also welcome the UK government's support of the Tata Steel Plant in Wales, and I look forward to constructive dialogue to a similar package being available for Grangemouth to the Cabinet Secretary has written to the UK Government to seek a further discussion. Michelle Thompson. I thank the First Minister for that response and it is indeed heartening to hear that the UK Government are now open to giving support to the vitally important chemical cluster in Grangemouth in my constituency. There is a potential for the refinery to move quickly to a biorefinery to be utilised for uh, sustainable aviation fuel. In other words, a just transition for workers right now. This would require support from the UK Government in terms of their policy barriers surrounding the HEFA cap. What indications, if any, are there that the UK Government realise this potential, are willing to take the steps necessary and act in the best interests of Scotland for this vitally important national asset? First Minister. Michelle Thompson is absolutely right. Uh, there is a huge opportunity 
in relation to that uh, transition to net zero uh, for uh, Grangemouth. And it's clear, however, there are serious regulatory barriers to which uh, Michelle Thompson has already spoken to, um, to the owners uh, of Grangemouth to develop those opportunities, such as uh, SAF, Sustainable uh, Aviation Fuel. Uh, the company has made clear that a major barrier to that immediate investment, and I stress again, immediate investment uh, in a biorefinery at the site, is the UK government's proposed SAF mandate and that HIPAA cap, HIPAA cap uh, that was mentioned uh, by Michelle uh, Thompson. That requires action from the UK government, and I believe that action should be immediate and urgent. Grangemouth's hard workers and the wider community cannot be left uh, at the mercy of UK government inaction. So the Scottish Government wants to secure the best possible future for Grangemouth. Uh, the key powers in this area, of course, lie, uh, regrettably, uh, at Westminster. So we will continue to push them to make the necessary changes to ensure that it plays a key role in powering Scotland's drive to net Thank zero. You. And I hope all First members Minister. of this chamber can get behind uh, the request that we've made Briefly, to the UK please. Government to help that transition, uh, that, that transition for Grangemouth and their workers. Question number five, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the Scottish Government's plans to open the first safe drug consumption room in Glasgow later this year, what assurances he can provide that other areas of drug policy, including spaces for residential rehabilitation, will not be deprioritised? First Minister. It absolutely won't be deprioritised. Drug deaths are, of course, a public health emergency, and we remain absolutely committed to investing an additional £250 million in our national mission to reduce harm and deaths caused by drugs. Uh, we'll continue to take a, a person-centred approach to address the wider needs of some of our most vulnerable people. We have been clear in our commitment to support the establishment of a safer drug consumption facility in Scotland. Uh, to give uh, Annie Wells a hope, a uh, sense of reassurance, funding was earmarked in the National Mission Budget in the knowledge that Glasgow might need to proceed quickly following the Lord Advocate's position. So no existing drug and alcohol services will therefore be affected to fund this pilot. Uh, we remain absolutely committed to expanding uh, residential rehabilitation capacity by 50% by the end of this parliament. And this includes the expansion of Beechwood House in Inverness, which I'm pleased to say broke ground this week. This will add much needed capacity in the Highlands when it opens in October. Annie Wells. I thank the First Minister for that response. Residential rehabilitation is a vital way of not just helping drug users beat addiction, but to help them get their lives back. And yet the most recent figures show people starting places in these facilities fell to their lowest in the last in more than two years. We know there aren't fewer people addicted to drugs. So why have those receiving this kind of help reduced? Can the First Minister assure those, these vulnerable people that his government will not oversee further reduction in places? First Minister. Well, first of all, we've obviously maintained uh, the drugs uh, budget for 24-25. That's in the face uh, of, of course, significant cuts to our resource budget uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And in terms of the expansion of residential rehab, investment in 77 uh, capacity projects combined provides an increase of 172 beds by 25-26, boosting the current rehab capacity in Scotland from 425 to 597. Far from being a cut, that's an increase of up over 40%. Uh, uh, we've, as I said, progressed work on safer drug consumption facilities. We're continuing to widen the access to life-saving naloxone. We're continuing to drive the implementation of the MAT uh, standards. In terms of the safer drug consumption facility, which Annie Wells mentioned in her first question, I'm pleased we've got to this position. It would have been far easier and far quicker, of course, if the UK government had approved it in the first place. Yeah. Paul Sweeney. The safe consumption pilot in Glasgow is a critical part of our effort to tackle the drug death crisis in our country, but we need many complementary tools in that toolkit to address the crisis effectively. The Turning Point 218 Centre in Glasgow, which supports women in the justice system with a number of critical issues, such as problematic drug use, is set to close next month due to funding cuts. So how can the First Minister say that other drug policy interventions are not being compromised when his government are allowing a well-established and effective lifeline service in Glasgow to close? Yeah. First Minister. I would say, uh, as I did in response, uh, I think to a question from Paul McNeill, uh, if it was last week or, or a couple of weeks ago, in relation to turning point uh, 218, uh, I know it is uh, an excellent service. Uh, these are, of course, local decisions uh, that are made in relation uh, to funding. In our discussions uh, with Glasgow City Council, they have made it clear uh, that if that service uh, has to close, they are already ensuring that there is the appropriate service provision available uh, for the women impacted. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. 
to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government plans to take in response to the reported rise in attacks on prison guards and weapons found in prisons. First Minister. Now, this Government and the Scottish Prison Service recognise the importance of providing safe, a safe and secure environment for those who live and indeed work in our prisons by adopting a zero tolerance approach towards all violence. Uh, while the SPS do report an increase in the recovery of weapons within prisons, this is likely to be a result of the positive impact of the mitigations that have been put in place to detect, uh, to deter and reduce the availability of contraband across the prison estate. Uh, the rise also highlights uh, the professionalism of our prison officers, their ability to identify and manage both risk uh, and threat. And whilst every act of violence towards staff is absolutely to be condemned, and I'm sure we'll be united uh, on that, uh, those acts of violence towards staff have reduced by 28% over the last four years. Holly McNeill. Thank the First Minister for that answer. Prison guard attacks have more than doubled in seven years, with nearly 4,000 weapons discovered in the last 10 years. So these include homemade weapons like knives made from razor blades melted into toothbrushes. So Phil Fairley from the Prison Officers Association said this week that the trend is growing at an alarming rate and coincides with an increase in assaults on both staff and prisoners. And we're heading towards record high population numbers and have more members of organised crime gangs inside our prisons than ever. I agree with the First Minister that we have a high regard for our prison guards and the work that they do. But does he agree that, he, that they should not have to fear going into work? And indeed, prisoners themselves should not fear being in prison. So what discussions are the Scottish Government have having to ascertain why these homemade weapons are circulating? And is the First Minister concerned that the increase may be symptomatic of severe overcrowding in Scottish prisons? First Minister. These are all uh, really excellent questions from uh, Polly McNeill, and I'll try to address uh, them. Uh, and, and if there's further information that the Justice Secretary can send to Polly McNeill, uh, I will ensure that that happens. In relation to the overcrowding in our prisons, I don't disagree uh, a jot, actually, with what Polly McNeill said. Our prison population is far too high, and therefore there's a number of efforts that are going in to try to reduce uh, that. Our numbers in remand are far too high. Uh, and our, our, our numbers in the female prison population are far too high. So there are a whole range of actions that Justice Secretary and I have spoken about uh, over a number of months now to try to reduce uh, the pressures. It's not a silver uh, bullet, I think, as Paul McNeill would absolutely understand, but there are a range of actions we can take. So I agree with her on reducing the prison population uh, being necessary. In relation to the actions that we're taking in, in, in regards to, to weapons and contraband into prisons, Again, the Justice Secretary will furnish her with further details, but we are investing uh, in technology such as rapid scan machines uh, and indeed other technology, uh, body scanners uh, and so on and so forth in order to try to detect uh, that contraband coming uh, into our prisons. Uh, and the last point I would make uh, to Polly McNeill is she's absolutely right to say that we must place value uh, on our prison, uh, on those who work uh, in our prisons. And that's why I was really pleased uh, that the latest pay proposal was overwhelmingly accepted by the SPAS partner trade unions. And that's a two-year deal that delivers a salary increase of 10% for the majority of staff, and with those in the lowest salaries benefiting from an over 12% rise uh, over the period of the pay award. So uh, I do believe that every single one of us uh, should uh, continue uh, to praise the efforts of our prison staff right up and down the country for the fantastic work that they do. We move to general and constituency supplementaries. I call Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. First Minister, in a written answer to me this week, and following Westminster's scrutiny of the XL bully dog reg regulations, it appears there are estimated to be 50,000 and 150,000 XL bully type dogs in England and Wales. Extrapolating those to Scotland would mean between 5,000 and 15,000 dogs. Given those numbers, can I ask what help there is now for existing and mainly responsible owners to identify whether or not their dog fits that particular breed type, what concerns the First Minister has of an influx to welfare charities, and what concerns he has that vets in Scotland may find themselves euthanising perfectly healthy dogs? 
First Minister. There are, there are very legitimate concerns that are raised by Christine Agreement. I know she has put on record uh, her uh, concern uh, and opposition uh, to the actions that we are having to take. And uh, I understand and willing to continue to have conversations with Christine Graham around the approach, because I do still believe the Scottish Government's deed not breed is the right approach. We have, unfortunately, uh, having to respond uh, to an unannounced un uh, decision that was made by the UK Government without any consultation with the Scottish Government uh, whatsoever. So we are, uh, and Siobhan Brown, the Minister, uh, will happily write to Christine Graham uh, with all of the, uh, in, in relation to all of the issues that Christine Graham uh, raises. We have to think about the impact on owners. Of course, we also have to think of the potential impact on animal rehoming uh, centres uh, as well as the veterinary uh, profession. So all these issues are being currently considered as we progress uh, these matters uh, at pace. Thank you. I call Jamie Halker Johnston. Thank you. Following the SNP Green Government's latest budget, NHS Highland has been forced to put development of the much needed and already delayed replacement for the Belford Hospital in Fort William on hold. The current building will be 60 years old next year and patients, staff and pretty much everyone except clearly the Scottish Government, recognise the urgent need for a new hospital. So can the First Minister tell me when the people of Lochaba, who have been campaigning for decades for a new Belford, will get the new hospital that they have been promised? First Minister. Uh, we will, of course, provide uh, this Chamber with an update in relation to our capital projects, including uh, health uh, capital projects. Uh, what I would say to Jamie Halcrow-Johnson is, of course, uh, in the face of a, re in face of a real terms cut, uh, not just to our resource budget, but a 10 per cent cut to our capital budget yeah. over the coming five years, we're continuing to ensure that our NHS gets a pay uplift, a very, very stark contrast yeah to a Conservative UK yeah. government that has prioritised tax cuts for the wealthy over prioritising spend in their NHS. Yeah. Rhoda Grant. The First Minister will be aware that the A9 North has been closed several times recently, cutting Caithness off from the remainder of the mainland and specialist maternity services. The First Minister also knows that Rigmore Maternity Unit cannot cope pleading to women being asked to leave the unit with nowhere to go, a hundred miles from home as their labour progresses. And despite this, the Scottish Government have paused Caithness Health Redesign and the Rigmore Maternity Unit Redevelopment. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister to revisit the downgrade and to continue the redesign so that women requiring specialist maternity care are never again abandoned? First Minister. Uh, can I say that the member raises uh, very important points uh, indeed and I have obviously been involved in this issue when I was Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care and know it well and uh, of course the member is absolutely correct that, that uh, those uh, uh, refurbishments uh, and construction uh, that to, to Rigmore is much required and much uh, needed. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for the NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care has outlined uh, the very challenging position in relation to capital projects due to the cut that we've experienced in the capital budget uh, from the UK government over the next five years. But I will confirm to this chamber that no final decisions have been taken on individual projects in NHS Highland. We absolutely remain committed to the reinstatement of consultant-led maternity services at Dr Gray's hospital and any decisions made in relation to Ragmore redevelopment uh, will have no impact on the overall uh, plan to return consultant-led services to Dr Gray's uh, by 2026. But notwithstanding all of that, uh, the points that the member raises uh, are important, are crucial, and that's why we key, are keen to update Parliament as soon as we can on our capital infrastructure projects. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Would the First Minister provide an assurance that while budgetary pressures mean the Scottish Government are not currently able to commit to the Empire Slavery and Scotland's Medium Steering Group's suggestion of £5 million for their work, which includes bringing forward plans for a dedicated space to address Scotland's role in, in Empire, colonialism and also historic slavery, that this has not been ruled out for the future and that consideration will be given to locating such a facility in my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency, given its links with the transatlantic slave trade. First Minister. The Scottish Government has allocated £200,000 uh, in this year's uh, budget to support the ongoing work related to empire, slavery and Scotland's museum recommendations. Uh, we will all work towards the recommendations published by the steering group. Uh, we will support the building of an effective, resilient organisation which contains the necessary skills to identify and acquire additional funding streams to allow this crucial work to progress uh, and develop over the coming years. The location 
Uh, I know of uh, any facility, of course, uh, remains uh, to be determined, de determined. But I hope Stuart McMillan uh, will take some comfort uh, from the reassurances of the importance that we place uh, on uh, the Empire Museum. And Miles Briggs. It is over uh, three years since SNP ministers cancelled the new Eye Pavilion Hospital replacement in Edinburgh, a decision the former First Minister agreed to U-turn on during the 2021 Holyrood election, pledging to build a new hospital during this Parliament. Can I ask the First Minister if he will keep that pledge to patients in Edinburgh and the south-east of Scotland? First Minister. Well, there's no uh, doubting, of course, that the Eye Pavilion it, it does need uh, built. We need to replace uh, the current infrastructure uh, that is there. So there's no doubting uh, across uh, any political party that that has to be done. But I go back to the point that I made to his colleagues. Uh, we are having to take forward capital spending projects uh, in the face of uh, high inflation in terms of construction costs, but a 10 per cent cut to our capital budget over the next four, five years. That is uh, being done, uh, being imposed upon Scotland by the Conservatives. So Miles Briggs has every right to ask us about the progress we're making. I would hope he would also use any influence he has with the UK government to tell them to reverse that capital cut, which is having such significant impacts on our budget and on health infrastructure right up and down the country. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions.